chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, again, Paul focused uh, his exhortation to those made new in Christ for their everyday lives of worship on one particular issue throughout chapter 14, the relationship of the bold and the less bold in terms of their freedom in Christ and eating and drinking and the esteeming of certain days over others. In the first 13 verses of chapter 15, Paul writes to do two things. He wants to summarize the, that encouragement in a more general form, continuing to exhort them to be welcoming to one another rather than judgmental or self-righteous or bitter towards one another. And secondly, to give them the goal of that welcoming spirit in the church, that they would glorify God together with one voice. And so in the first seven verses, the ministry and example of Christ are put forward as a basis for their welcoming of one another. This morning, in verses 8 through 13, the testimony of the Scripture is given as the basis or the foundation for their ongoing fellowship and worship together. When God welcomed in the Gentiles, non-Jewish peoples, as full members into the family of God, He was setting a tone. He was making a proclamation for the attitude and posture of the church for all time towards each other. God's welcoming spirit God's welcoming design of all nations is the basis for everything the church is called to do and to be. God's will is that the welcoming culture and behavior of the church would be a deliberate means of testimony to the gospel, to one another, to our neighbors, and to the world. We find our identity as new creation in the outstretched arms of Jesus who opened them wide at the cross to draw all people, all people, to himself that we may do His will, God gives us the sure and steadfast hope of His Son revealed to us in the word of the gospel. All joy and peace in this world belong to the one who believes in the God of hope. Let me pray. Father, thank You for Your word this morning. Lord, watch over my mind as I speak. Lord, may I be clear and concise. Would You help me to preach the text to be humble under it, to preach in service of it rather than making it serve me and my purposes. God, would you watch over all in this room this morning? Would you enable all of them by the power of your Holy Spirit to hear and to receive the gift of your truth and the hope that is ours in Christ? May we all know this together. We ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 8, he writes, for. So, Following on from verse 7, the fact that Christ has welcomed you, he says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. Why did Jesus Christ become a Jew? Why did he become a physical descendant of Abraham in his incarnation when he came to the earth? In order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. That's reason number one. To prove to the Jewish people that their God keeps his promises. Verse 9, and in order that, so he had a twofold equal purpose, that the Gentiles also, along with the Jews, might glorify God for his mercy. For God to make promises to bless humans is pure mercy, because he owes us nothing but justice. God wanted the Gentiles to also receive and benefit from His mercy as the Jewish peoples undeservingly had. Jesus came to prove God's Word is true and extend the reach of God's merciful promises to the rest of the world. God wanted what Israel had been given to go public, that the world might know this is what God is like. This objective gift from God, then, is the source of all Christian hope, of all our hope. Objective truth is the source of our hope. What God has done, what God has said, is the source of our hope. If we look to ourselves to find hope, to muster it up, we won't have any. And the little that we might be able to convince ourselves we should have, we'll lose. This is the grounds then for why we ought to be welcoming to one another in the body of Christ, which is the big push from verse 7. Because Jesus Christ came from heaven to bring sinners like us near to God. 
there in the middle of verse 10, as it is written, or verse 10, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's 2 Samuel 22.50 in Psalm 18.49. Verse 10, and again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Deuteronomy 32.43. Verse 11, and again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Psalm 117, verse 1. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Prophesied in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Then, by the way, all the way out in Revelation 5, 5 and 22, 16, it's affirmed for certain that Jesus Christ is this Savior, the root of Jesse, whose merciful will to be merciful to the Gentiles and bring them into his kingdom, is going to be fulfilled. That hope in Isaiah 11, we find in Revelation, will come true, will be fulfilled. This is the heart of God for the nations to be included in the consummation of human history, also as recipients of God's promise-making and promise-keeping mercy. The gathering in of the Gentiles into the people of God is one of the most pervasive, consistent, present themes in Old Testament Scripture. It's everywhere. Paul pulls from the Pentateuch here to prove his point from Deuteronomy and Samuel. He pulls from the writings in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Psalms. He pulls from the prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures from Isaiah to prove for certain that welcoming the Gentiles into the people of God was not some late addition to God's will, nor is it something that he was obligated to do and just didn't want to leave anybody out randomly. It wasn't some concession God just decides to make, even though what He really is about is Israel. No, the inclusion of the Gentiles has been part and parcel to God's design for all creation the whole time since before God created anything. The reason Israel then, as He's writing to many Christians in Rome who are Jewish, the reason they cannot think too highly of themselves, and the reason we should not overestimate the place of Israel in God's plan for creation, is that Israel was the means by which God meant to save the world by being the vessel of the Messiah God promised to send to fulfill the promises made to Adam, to Abraham, and to David. So we find through Paul, through the New Testament Scriptures in Christ, that Israel was not the goal, but the means to accomplish God's end for creation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the shepherd of His people, was sent by God to do two main things. Prove that God tells the truth, and prove or to bring forth praise from all nations, because they too have always been the intended recipients of His mercy. The gospel is the message of God's truthfulness and God's mercy for all nations, for the whole world. It's so big and so vast in its glorious expanse as the power of God for salvation that it not only saves individual sinners, yes, but Paul is writing it also brings them together as one from even literally the furthest distances apart. That is in the design of the gospel to reveal the heart of God for people. Paul talks later in 2 Corinthians about how what God has done is reconcile the world to Himself through the death of Christ. The whole world reconciled. It's been done, accomplished in Christ. To keep putting some divide between Jews and Gentiles, even a spiritual one, runs counter to God's purpose revealed in Scripture. Why? Because there is to be nothing that threatens the believer's hope that Christ is for them, especially not poor interpretation of Scripture. Nothing is worse than using the Bible to create doubt and a lack of identity in people. Verses 1 through 7 and verses 8 through 13. We looked at 1 through 7 last week. Today we're looking at these. They're actually written if you'll notice, in the form of two prayers by Paul. They're written mainly as petitions or requests. See that in verse 5 for the first section, verse 13 today for the second. And for these prayers, to make them, to inform them, 
Paul draws on four key elements from the whole letter of Romans up to this point. He's bringing all these theological propositions together to shape these prayers. The first element that Paul uses from the whole letter of Romans to make these prayers, to ground these prayers, is the fact that all Old Testament Scripture is about Jesus Christ and has all been written and presented by God in order to bring comfort, encouragement, endurance, and hope to those who read and receive it today and at all times. The second element of Romans he's brought into these prayers is that the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, testified to in Scripture, proclaimed in the Gospel, they actually display and prove the truthfulness and the mercy of God. Since both of those things about God were in question among the Jewish Christians in Rome and many other places as we read in the New Testament because of the Gospel. Now, for some reason, there were many Jewish Christians or Jewish people doubting that God was faithful to His promises because it sure doesn't look like it. The problem is not in God's promises, but that they didn't read the Scriptures correctly or with honest hearts and listen to what God had clearly said. And so now, whether or not God keeps His promises, that's been a major issue in Romans. Whether or not God can be called merciful has been a major issue in Romans. And so Paul is drawing on all of that here. Now that he's proven those two things are true about God, to offer these requests for the church as he closes down this great letter. The mission and ministry of Jesus show God's truthfulness and that He kept His promises made to the patriarchs in Christ. Now that He's come and risen from the dead, it's proven that He keeps them. <coughs> and His mercy, the mission and ministry of Jesus show God's mercy and that He reveals Himself to be the Savior of all peoples including the Gentiles. This was the heart of his old argument back in chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, if you remember. Thirdly, the third element of Romans that he pulls together is the fact that Jews and Gentiles are being saved together in Christ is consistent with all of God's Old Testament promises. That didn't come later. Or that God had to figure out something to do with all these Gentiles coming in because what He was really about was Israel. No, this Jesus going after the cross, making the gospel available to everybody was the plan from the beginning. When God first promised Adam and Abraham and David, this was the plan. You see that all throughout the Old Testament. That was the very point of Romans 9 through 11, wasn't it? In fact, verses 9 through 12 right here in chapter 15 are even more corroboration from the Old Testament of everything that Paul has been saying. That all Israel, God's own dear children from among the Jews and Gentiles, the true Israel, what the word Israel actually means, he told us in Romans 9 through 11, they will be saved and together will glorify God in Christ. And fourthly, to ground this prayer here in the theology of Romans as a whole, Paul prays that they would have comfort, endurance, and hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's such a new concept in the minds of the hearers because in the past in the days before Christ came and lived and died and was risen and ascended the Spirit was not given to every member of the people of God He the Holy Spirit only came upon people at certain times to do certain tasks but the fact that now every child of God has the Holy Spirit within him dwelling within him is evidence that Christ has won the victory that God's gifts have been poured out on all creation he introduced this truth about the Holy Spirit's comfort and endurance and hope for all of us back in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. He explained them even more in chapter 18, verses 13 through 30, that the indwelling Spirit is the one who testifies to the believer's status as sons and heirs of God and gives us encouragement by doing so as we go through afflictions in this life. And so, then comes the petition in verse 13. May the God of hope, remember in chapter 1, verses 7, verses 1 through 7, what was He the God of? Encouragement and endurance. Here, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Our hope as Christians, but anyone's hope if they have it, 
comes from what we believe. Hope comes from what you believe is true or will happen. That which threatens hope for the Christian only comes from lies. What an exhortation to follow all these great proclamations about God's welcoming design for all nations. God sent His Son to prove that He keeps His promises and to pour out His mercy on sinners who don't deserve anything but His justice. He is the truth. He is salvation. He is grace. He is the God of encouragement and endurance. And Paul says, may that God fill you with all joy and peace in believing Him. Right? Absolutely. Why would He not? He's able to. He desires to. All joy and peace belong to the one who believes in the God of hope. Hope for humanity isn't found finally in the things of this world or in the increase of wealth or the improvement of our situation. Last night my wife and I were driving home from the big Sam's Club type store in Bridgeville. We're driving back home. We, we're coming through Elm Grove and there's that big billboard that tells you what the Mega Millions and the Powerball is. 400 million for the Mega Millions, 493 for Powerball right now. That's a nice chunk of cheese. I mean, even if I mean, even if they take half of that, which I believe the government's entitled to everything that you own, apparently. So let's say they take everything and you just you just clear a measly fifty million. You know, that would change some things. But but are those things reason for hope? No, because they have no guarantee. They're just there. You might win. You probably won't. Right. So the, the, there's, there's that kind of hope. There's, man, I wish that would happen. And we come to think that that's hope. That's, that's hope, maybe as the world defines it. That's not hope as God defines it. God is the God of hope. Put that in with all the titles that you have for Him, that you call Him, that you name Him by. The God of hope. He created it. He sustains it. He rules over it. He guarantees what He promises. That's the basis of the Christian's hope. That's really, ultimately, why the Bible was written. So that the hope we have in Christ, we would have example after example after example that when this God makes a promise, He keeps it. Therefore, it makes all the sense in the world to hope in Him. It makes very little sense to hope in things that we just want to be true, but have no guarantee they will be. God can and often does grant wonderful material things to us sometimes, doesn't He? But hope is something that only the God of hope really knows how to give, because only God really knows what hope is. We're used to having our hopes dashed, our dreams defeated, never coming to fruition. Because if we are the gods of our own hope, we're limited by what we have the power to do to bring it to fruition. The Christian's hope isn't grounded in the self. It isn't grounded in mere ideas or wishes for the future. Hope is ultimately only the result of believing God's Word to us in Christ. Only God knows what hope truly is, since only God can provide the things that are the basis for hope in the first place. Hope comes from what we believe is true. And for those who receive God's grace in the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ, hope is the down payment on an immovable, unchanging, untouchable reality. Life in the new heavens and the new earth for all eternity with Jesus Christ in the glory and beauty of His presence where evil and sin and sickness and pain and all these things are no more, never to return. And so, beloved, there's something crucial for us to realize in this section of Scripture here as we try to bring the themes of 14 and 15 together now. As Jonathan Grothy writes, there is an urgent biblical divine movement and encouragement toward the manifestation 
of the God-given oneness of the one church in praise to God with one heart and voice. Paul is laboring here with words inspired by the Holy Spirit to shape unity and oneness and a welcoming spirit in the church. It's not a throwaway thought. It's not just, wouldn't it be nice? Because that's how we normally talk about it. Wouldn't it be nice if we had the kind of unity that the Bible talks about? Why don't we? What's in the way of it? These are the questions we have to ask. Why can't we have what the Bible says God has given? He's not a poor benefactor. The fellowship we are meant to have and enjoy as the church, as new creation in Christ in the midst of the old creation, this world, is the result of submitting ourselves, each and every one of us, to the truth of this gospel. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For the righteous shall live by faith. We have to get this idea out of our heads that the gospel is something mainly for unbelievers. That that part of God or His truth of the Bible, that's for conversion. That's to get people in the door. It's not really for sanctification to God throughout every day of our lives. For that, we need the law. Right? For that, I need you to tell me how to live. Now that I've been made new, I want to give my life to God. And so what I need from you, preacher, is you to teach me how to live, what to do. I don't need you to preach Jesus to me all the time. I got him when I was 12 in VBS or whatever your story is, right? Don't rely on yourself for sanctification. Beloved, salvation is not just God putting batteries in your back. It's Him rescuing you. It's, it's not swimming lessons. It's the rescue from drowning. There is... Christ is sanctifying us. Hebrews 10 tells us this. Through His gift to us at the cross. That's the content of the Gospel. The content of the Gospel is what's sanctifying us. The death of Christ is what's sanctifying us. This gift He gave to us. There is no Christian fellowship. There is no Christian fellowship where the Gospel is not operating as the priority in the hearts and minds of the people. That is the welcoming heart of God in Christ for us. Where that's not the thing shaping and driving the hearts and minds of those in the church, you can have fellowship because people have stuff in common. But Christian fellowship, that requires the power of the Holy Spirit working in the proclamation of the Gospel. Don't mistake the ability to have fellowship as something that is distinctly spiritual in the church. Do you know why the world is filled with clubs? Because people that have common interests and goals like to get together and hang out and talk about them. It's camaraderie, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. We even have a club here in Moundsville called the Elite Club. Now, I've never been... I don't know if you're in it. If you're in it, please don't be offended. But in that club, apparently it's okay to say elite and not elite. Like, that's a word. You, you can't just change words. All right? But hey, man, you get together, it's great, right? Someday somebody's going to, either somebody here is in the club or they're going to tell somebody, and I'm going to get my house firebombed or something, but it just blows my mind. But when you have things in common, you like to click up, you like to get together. And we start to think that, that, that Christian fellowship is like the Christian version of that. The Beloved, fellowship that God talks about is not something you don't need the Holy Spirit to make happen. Right? We, we were not meant to bump into each other once or twice a week on the daily road of life. I mean... Now, again, I'm not saying the answer to that is like more gatherings. That's, that's really not what I mean. But uh, again, there's nothing about the church that we have the power to create, much less sustain. So when we hear about fellowship and welcoming, don't just think, okay, we need to be nicer. 
Atheists can be nice. No, they're usually not. But they can be, absolutely. So that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a fruit of the Spirit. You and I can pull fellowship off. I mean, you, you, you get everybody, what are all the jokes about Baptists? We, we always make casseroles for potlucks. And yeah, because good food is good food. You can get all kinds of people together with some good food. You get all kinds of people together with bad food. It's just fun to eat. We may have friendship and camaraderie and mutual interests and goals. Maybe similar political affiliations, all those things. But the world can pull off fellowship based on those things. Those without Christ, that reject Christ on purpose, can have fellowship without those things. Any time a group agrees on a common truth, be it godly or not, there can be fellowship. That's not Christian fellowship. It's being shaped by the gospel where we are so welcoming of one another that the peace we enjoy is completely foreign to the world. We, we don't want them saying, well, that's just as buddy-buddy as, as where, you know, my, my Boy Scout club or whatever, or my fantasy football league or whatever. It's just like that. No, this is to be something heavenly on the earth. That's what this is supposed to be. And, and think about how our anemic view of fellowship can tend to inform our entire practice as a church. It just becomes a hall of differing ideas and voices, and I have my say, and you have your say, and we just... <laughs> that's what Jesus died for? That's what Jesus died for us to have? He didn't need to die for that. We can do that over our political party. And those stink. So most church fellowship might just be an anemic word for what you could find down at the local VFW with all of its board meetings and disputes and everything that we also have and call fellowship. We cannot create the fellowship the Bible is talking about in Romans 15. We cannot just up and decide to be this kind of welcoming. This fellowship is only created by subordination to the radical truth of this gospel as the basis of a hope that is so transcendent, affects so much in us, it makes us into welcoming rather than tribal, self-righteous, defensive, divisive, abrasive people. And because we're all like that about the same thing, we have this fellowship. No, 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 no. We offer something categorically different than what you can find with your friends who knit or crochet or crochet or your golfing buddies or your friends that meet for football games down at Buffalo Wild Wings and all those things are fine. They're just not what this is. The answer is found in the church's ongoing and increasing wonder at the truth of the gospel. Or the church becomes the result of the lack of that. Humanity is more divided and tribal than we've ever been. How many of you have been seeing on the news anything that's going on in France right now? Anybody? Just raise your hand just so I know you. Okay, yeah. That's, I mean, that's coming soon to a country near you. I mean, we basically just hate each other. I know that that might sound melodramatic, but we don't just dislike each other anymore. Everybody that differs with us is a threat to the life we want, even if it's just by their ideas and opinion. Not this place. Not this people. You see, we can't have a shadow of that here. Not an ounce of it. And look, it's, it's more sociologically and culturally comfortable to keep our camaraderie small and narrow to only flock together with birds of the same feather, that's very natural. We bring this into our church lives with us, though. And so we just, we click up like remotes, right? We just click, 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 click all over the place. Denominations themselves become places for Christians to hide with people that share their views so they don't have to even worry about being, like I'm welcoming of everybody in my church, because everybody's the same, right? 
Notice that the church is built for differences that are put aside for the sake of one common goal and one common proclamation. If a church would rather serve and make sure everybody gets to have their different say, you're not going to have Christian fellowship. We're all absorbed into Christ. We retain our identity, but our identity is new in Christ, this bigger person whose agenda matters more and whose opinion matters more and whose truth carries more weight. Again, it's, it's not hard to be welcoming to people with whom you have all things in common. So if, if a church isn't multiplying by disciple-making, you end up staring at the same faces for 50 years. And that's fine in one sense, but you become so comfortable with each other, you can't even see straight. You can't even see how other people might not feel welcome in that because you're fine. Right? But it is hard to walk into a church that's been around for a long time and everybody's been friends since high school or grade school. That is hard. So how does a group like that, because there's nothing wrong with staying together for a long period of time. That's wonderful and it's rare. But we aren't an institution that's meant to just stay static and maintain buildings. We are here to make disciples, to multiply like a family does. Just like a family does. Not by procreation necessarily, but by proclamation. By the word that creates faith, that creates life, we multiply. Again, being welcoming to people with whom you have all things in common, that doesn't take the breath of the Holy Spirit on us. And where there is no breath of the Holy Spirit sanctifying us through Christ, there is no church. It's just an organization. It's just an institution. But what does our Savior do? What has Christ done? He opened His arms wide at the cross. That's His posture to the world. Arms wide open. Drawing all men to Himself and towards one another into the one new family and fellowship of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is the one place on earth where we're restored to a oneness that only comes from heaven. What we are called to display is a oneness the world is literally unable to replicate. It got really sad when, when, when business models and all that started to influence what the church thought it should be like. It would be great if, if that was flipped on its head. If the oneness and fellowship of the church began to be the light that was shaping society. You don't need a government to do that. You need Christians to do that. That is why breaking fellowship and letting bitterness fester and cold shoulders continue over unbiblical things is such a killer to everything the church is called to be about. Beloved, to do the word of Romans 15 takes a wisdom and kindness we don't naturally possess. The human instinct is to turn matters that are just those of culture and preference into matters of doctrine and confession of truth and error. If you disagree with this, you're not my friend. And it ends up being something that you just really like, not a matter of the truth. Our traditions can become so important and meaningful to us, even if they're not wrong in and of themselves, that when someone doesn't value what we do, or as much as we do, we want to be separate from them. We don't want to have fellowship with them. Not the kind the Bible's talking about. You can smile in people's faces. We do this every day. We're pros at being fake to each other. Like, I'm sorry to drop that on you, but we're all great at being fake. Smile at people you don't like. Right? We do that every day. We... You ever done that when somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're mad and you want to give them a symbol, but it's not a wave, right? And they cut you off and then they give you the I'm sorry. And instead of you're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, you don't like that person. Like if they get pulled over in a second, you're going to drive by. <laughs> you're going to laugh at them, right? I've never done that, but. This is what happens when our flesh gets in the way of our hope. Right? It's, it's, it's not worth it. Like it. It's not worth it. There's nothing worth losing your hope over. 
Beloved, it's all we have while we're here. There's nothing worth damaging what you have here, what Christ wants you to have here. There's nothing worth damaging it, nothing. Especially as the world starts to tighten its grip on it. This is one of the many reasons why the church is still in such great need of the gospel. Christians. In such great need to see Jesus dying with his arms stretched out wide to us. My dad always had a picture in his office that was a, of a cross, and it just said, I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And he said, this much, and spread his arms out and died for me. I remember that picture as a little kid. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and hope and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. What kind of people abound in hope? What would a person that abounds in hope look like to our world, to America today, in France today, in Africa today, this day? What would hope look like? What would a person who abounds in hope look like in China on July 2nd, 2023. Could you imagine? For hope in God does not disappoint. Forgiveness of sins has risen from the grave. Life has come. Peace is ours in Christ, and it's yours for the receiving. Every single last one of us.